As of yesterday, yours truly is now the owner of a new company. Now that we've closed, I can now share all of the details about the good, the bad, the game plan, the history, all of that fun stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this really into two videos. In this one, I'm going to talk about the acquisition process, how I heard about the company, the communication and negotiation process, the paperwork, due diligence, payment, and so on. So if you've been interested in potentially buying a business or even selling a business, you may find this process interesting. In another video, I'm going to talk about my first day owning the business, my game plan going forward, my priorities. I still have a lot of setup to get through, so I'll take you on that journey with me. Uh, the company I just purchased is called SteamAway. They're a business here in Indiana that has been running for about 20 years. And the previous owner started by himself, and over the last several years, he's been working with his son and nephew. A side tangent real quick. I do get asked a lot about how I hear about real estate opportunities or business opportunities or consulting opportunities. So I'm going to address that real quick. And honestly, the way I get most opportunities is I just let people know what I'm looking for. And I ask them to send things my way if they come across anything. So I was on a phone call with a friend who owns a construction company. And I told him that I was in the market to buy another business. And I asked him to keep me in mind if he heard of any. And he told me, well, it's ironic you ask. There was this guy that I just talked to who got a new job at a staffing agency. And when he was pitching me on uh, asking me if I needed any construction staffing help, he told me that he had this company he was trying to sell. I'll see if I can get a hold of the card and I'll get it to you. Um, so I followed up with my friend every single day for about a week. <laughs> and he probably just got sick of me texting and calling him. And he agreed to meet up with me at his office to find a business card. So we agreed to meet. And when we got to his office, turns out he had forgotten his keys to get inside. So we went on this fun little investigative drive around the city to where he thought his office was. We found a carpet cleaning van, uh, found the number on it, called it, and turns out it was the same guy uh, looking to sell. That was lead mode. And from there, I mentally shifted from lead mode to filter mode. In this mode, I want to find out as quickly as possible whether there seems to be a match between what I'm looking for in a business and what the other party is looking for in selling. I find that most of the time, there isn't a fit. And I've learned to be okay with that. Just yesterday, for example, I had a real estate lead come my way. And when I drove by the house and checked inside, turns out it needed way more work than I initially thought. So my offer for the house was far less than the person was wanting to sell it for. So we shook hands, I wished him luck, and I went on my way. In a business, I want to find out what the business is, the area, the revenues, the people, the history, the assets, and what they're looking to sell for, all in a pretty quick conversation. Sometimes that information is kind of sensitive. Most of the time people realize I don't have any malicious intent behind the questions and we just have a good chat. But sometimes there's this feeling of protection and anxiety behind answering sensitive questions. So if I get that feeling, what I'll do is I'll recommend we sign an NDA. Now what an NDA stands for is a non-disclosure agreement. Essentially what it means is what the business owner tells me, I agree to keep confidential and I'm not gonna use any of the information to hurt his business. In this case, we didn't sign an NDA until later in the conversation, once I started asking about specific customer information, but sometimes people are hesitant to even tell you their company name without this document signed. So during this filter conversation, I found out that the business has really declined quite drastically over the last two years. They had a lot of customer information, but they, had declined from consistently doing about 200,000 in yearly revenue two years ago to 120,000 last year to about 30,000 so far this year. So really a pretty big tank. The reason was because of the owner's health. Because of his poor health, he got to the point where he basically had shut down the business. Uh, he still had a website and a phone number, but he wasn't answering any customer calls or giving the business really any attention and his son and nephew didn't have any desire to take over the business. They had two mans in operation with two cleaning rigs, but he had, at that point he had sold one of them. He had an entire storage unit full of equipment for doing all sorts of services like buffing, odor removal, color seal, but most of the business revenue was carpet cleaning. So now that I had a basic understanding of the history and the current standing of the business, I needed to know the ballpark of what the owner was looking to sell for. I personally break the standard negotiation rule here. Um, apparently, the best negotiation tactic is to always be the first to set a purchase price hook. 
and set it really low. An example might be me saying, hmm, looks like the business really isn't in the best position. You're probably looking for like a couple thousand dollars just to get out of it, right? This really isn't my style. <laughs> so uh, what I do is I try to find a win on both sides. And I find that those type of hooks really do get you the best deals. But personally, I just don't sleep as good at night. So the way I went about it was just to ask him how much he was looking to sell the business for. If the number is within the ballpark of what I'm looking to pay, then I'll move into the next stage. If not, I'll give a counter where I'm at in my head. And a lot of the time, like especially in real estate, we're not even close and we politely go our separate ways. In this case, he told me he was hoping to get somewhere around $80,000 for the business, which would essentially include the name, website, Google My Business, the, the domain, the list of customers, the van, carpet cleaning equipment, the storage unit full of extra equipment, really all of it. And I told him that was probably high for what I was looking for. Um, but first I wanted to take a look at his online presence and get back to him. But I was probably more in the realm of twenty dollars to $30,000. When I said that, he didn't say no, but he did tell me that he thought that was low. But to take a look at the website and to give him a call. So at this point, I'm moving from filter phase to due diligence. Now, there are two things I will do at this point. I'll do a light due diligence where I basically look at the bones of the business to see if there are any big red flags. These are things like lawsuits, negative publicity, um, online presence, and stuff like that. Uh, and if things check out there, then I'll give an actual offer in the form of a letter of intent. Now, what a letter of intent does is it basically tells the seller that I'm serious about buying the company and I'm willing to give an offer and a timeline on when I'm looking to close. But I need to continue doing due diligence to make sure that all the details check out. Now, the letter of intent in my case is non-binding. So if I continued to dissect the business and it just didn't make sense, I could walk away, kind of like an inspection period when buying a house. Because I didn't have access to Google Analytics, I hired a freelancer on Upwork to do an analysis for me. And it turns out the business had a lot of good going for it. It owned the domain carpetcleaningfortwayne.com, had good reviews, had good history, and it ranked decent for a bunch of keywords. The traffic, however, of the last year had really taken a big dive. And I would need to work pretty hard just to get it back up to where it was. But beyond that, I didn't really see any big red flags. So I decided it was time to make an offer. So I called the owner and I told him that I was willing to pay $25,000 for the business. And the next step was to sign a letter of intent so, he could, so I could look deeper into the financials, his software and his equipment. And da 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 da. He said he had a feeling that I was going to offer that, but he wasn't willing to sell it for any less than $50,000. I'm still an emotional person, but during these times, I really try to let math determine my actions and not my emotions. It's really tempting for me to start justifying a higher price um, than the math justifies. And to be honest, it's really easy for the seller to do the same thing. So I might tell myself, well, it was doing a bunch of revenue in the past, so it's probably worth more. And the work I need to put in really isn't that much. And the seller might say something like, well, I know it's nothing special now, but knowing your talents, you'll be able to quadruple this business in no time. You know, something like that. My rule with buying, however, is I buy it where it's currently at. I don't buy on historical success, although I do buy on history, which is kind of a nuance. Um, and I don't buy on future potential. I buy it where it's at. So honestly, things kind of died after that. I told him that the price didn't make sense for me and I wished him luck and told him that if anything changed to let me know. And now about a week later, uh, I had gotten the deeper results of the website audit that I had done. And I texted the owner just to ask if he wanted the report, seeing as it might be interesting for him. When I texted him, he actually thought I was someone else so he texted me back saying, and I, these are actually my texts, hey, I'm actually selling the company. Do you want to buy it? So I said, yes, potentially. How much? And he said, we would have to discuss the details, but I'm letting it go at a steal of a price. You could figure on about 60000 Then me again. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about just the website. This is Tyler Hinkson. We already talked about the business as a whole. 
I am interested in buying the business, but I'd be willing to pay $25,000 cash. He then responded, oh shoot, LOL. I thought you were somebody else, my bad. <laughs> uh, the website is supposed to be down, but it is still up. Can you do 30? I told him I'd think on it for a day and then call him the next day, which I did. I told him that $25,000 really was where I was at, but I didn't care or want everything in the business. I didn't care for all of the extra stuff he had in his storage unit, for example. I just wanted the essentials for the business. He could continue to sell the other stuff and, and honestly probably make more than $5,000. So he told me he wanted to think about it for a day. And the next day he called me and he told me we had a deal. So I quickly created a letter of intent and I got it sent over to him. And I also put down $1,000 in earnest money. And uh, we entered the due diligence phase. Um, now, rather than being like too lengthy with this part, I essentially looked over his finances, his service history, looked at his pricing, his vendors, his customer list, really a lot of pretty sensitive information, which I needed just to make sure the company made sense for me to buy. Um, I had to make sure that he had credentials and access to everything he was wanting to sell. And during that time, I was able to help make a list and start organizing everything to allow for a smooth transition. A few weeks later, we, we did make it to closing. I sent him a purchase agreement, which he signed, outlining the details of the sale. Um, now, another tangent here, there, there are two main ways to sell a business. There's a stock purchase agreement or an asset purchase agreement. A stock purchase agreement is where I purchase the entity of the business. I take over all of the business history and liability. Now, this is good when I need to take over lines of credit, vendor accounts, accounts receivable, and stuff like that. But I also get stuck with any liability, um, like potentially getting sued by a past client. Uh, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not. Now, the asset purchase agreement is where I just buy the assets of the business, but no part of the entity. It's literally like buying a car or something at the store. I buy the items and I pay for the items and I'm responsible for the items going forward but I'm not responsible for any past bills or accidents or tickets or anything like that. So I structured our deal as an asset purchase agreement and we closed on August 14th. I paid him the full $25,000 in cash. Now, not all of the purchases that I do are cash. Um, sometimes I do owner finance deals. Essentially what that is, is where I will give a little bit of money down um, and then the seller becomes the bank for me and I make payments to him over time. And I've sold businesses this way as well. After we closed, I paid cash. He gave me the title to the van, transferred everything over to me. We shook hands, told each other good luck, and, uh, and we got a picture. <laughs> so, uh, so stay tuned to see what it is that I actually purchased. Some of it's good and some of it's really gross. So I'm, I think you'll be interested to see how day number one went. So I'll walk you through the website, Google my business, the vehicle, the service, and I'll explain as I go what steps I take as I take them to take the business hopefully up and up.